Hi there guys, welcome to the Guitar Hour once again. As you can see, joined by Dan Smith as usual. Hello. Um, Mr Beebe has very kindly joined us again, so David Beebe, thank you for joining us again. Hi, oh, welcome. Pleasure. So, it's only been a week. This is, I think, possibly like the quickest we've ever done, or the quickest gap we've ever had between a Guitar Hour. Uh, we've got plenty of topics for you guys, some of which are interesting and mildly, whoops, let me turn this down, mildly controversial, which is always good. <laughs> I don't know if controversial is the right word, but um, you guys have been brilliant actually this week. Um, we asked last time if you guys could uh, have some kind of interaction with us on our Facebook page, which is facebook.com forward slash the guitar hour, basically. I always forget it. Um, I don't know why, because it's really easy to remember. So you, a couple of you guys, uh, I think we had three questions on there. So we've got those written down. We're going to go through those today. Um, we're going to start with one question in particular that relates to the tuning that I use, this fourth tuning. And we've got our kind of main topic as usual. Um, and we're going to introduce a new concept today. Yeah, give it a go. I'm not sure what we're going to recommend within this concept because the concept is uh, related to our main topic. We haven't really had a chance to think about what we're actually going to recommend. But you'll see what I mean or what we mean later on um, when we get into it. Um, so, anything we, you need to talk about first, either of you guys, before we get started? Well, you mentioned Budapest. Yeah. You want to tell them about that then? <laughs> we, got, we got Budapest, Budapest. Budapest, yeah, whichever. Oh, Pest, Pest, that's how I say it, right? I have no idea. We're going there. Uh, me and Tom are going to uh, visit the Fibonacci guys again. In Hungary. <laughs> yeah, in the land of Hungary, the kingdom of. <laughs> um, I wonder what we'll get up to this time. Last time we ended up on a uh, four man uh, bicycle ride around <laughs> like a, a local park. <laughs> it was quite bizarre. The whole experience was quite bizarre, but in a good way, in a good way. Um, yeah, so that'd be that be good. So what we what we doing when we're over there? Do we know? Um, well, I don't. Know. Can we repeat what Gabor said? We're going to be doing. No, probably there? not. But I mean, the idea is basically we're, we're going over to see the uh, guys from Fibonacci again, and um, we went there last August. Yeah, we originally went there to potentially pick up my uh, roadmaster, sort of. Yes. Um, Purely because. Well, actually, I'm trying to remember why we decided to do that because it seems a little bit more dangerous to pick it up and take it back on the plane than it does to ship it. But uh, we decided we were going to go over yeah, anyway, and yeah. we ended up we ended up staying in Budapest for just a few days, and it was absolutely brilliant. Two, three days. When it saw the Fibonacci guys, saw the workshop. They've got this great workshop um, that they kind of build just around 70 guitars a year in. So we're going to go over there again, but this time this is a complete holiday. It's actually my birthday next week, um, so it could get quite messy. <laughs> Like you've just had a fairly like messy few messy. days in Amsterdam, it could be very similar. Uh, so we shall see what happens, but it should be really good fun. And we're going to try, and this is totally dependent on the quality of the internet that we've got over there, but we're going to try and do a guitar ride. Dan and I will anyway, because Dave's not unfortunately joining us. No. Um, he's just had a big party weekend in Amsterdam, <laughs> so he can't, his liver can't handle it. I apologise if I'm not 100% functioning tonight with this. <laughs> I wouldn't worry about it. We'll ply you with more. I've got some some very, very just nice, very nice cognac <laughs> here. So this should, hey. that's a friend of mine bought me, so this should help you out. Awesome. Um, so we'll get you swigging that later on. Uh, but yeah, if the internet is good enough, we're going to try and do a live stream from um, from Budapest and maybe get Gavor on there. Oh, that'd be so good. Which would be great because he can talk a little bit about the guitars um, and we can show you a few different models and stuff and some of the ones they're working on. I have a new guitar in the works, which is roughly the same. Oh, should I tell them? Mm. I'm not no, sure. No, I don't reckon. No, we'll wait till it arrives. Um, yeah, it's a very interesting colour. Some of you guys might know. If you do know, don't reveal it in the chat. We'll reveal it later on. Um, hi to hi to all you guys. Still Andre Jordan Perks, <laughs> Boo, uh, Mark McGuigan. Uh, we've got El Wishy. We've got uh, Martin Miller watching as well. Uh, Guitar player eighty five. Trev, how are you doing, guys? Hope you're hope you're having a good evening. Um, so the first thing that we're going to cover, or I'm going to cover. Um, I'm going to be really annoying and stop these guys from talking because uh, someone's asked a specific question. Although it might, you guys might want to chip in on this as well is um, we were asked a specific question about fourths tuning because, and unfortunately, I can't remember his name. Sonny Intervals, thank you for following the stream. Thank you so much. Um, let me see if I can find the guy's name. So bear with me a second because it was on uh, our Facebook page. So, and it would be very polite of me to quote the guy's name to you. Call out. Uh, if I can remember how to do it, uh, which I'm not sure Post about. Post the page on the left. Keep going down. Post a page, post a page, post a page. Oh yeah, there we go. Ah, that's right, there's one in the way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, <clears> oh <throat> my word, now I have to pronounce this. Felipe Loli Quinan Junquiera. 
that might not have been that bad actually. That sounded yeah. like it could be okay. Um, he's he's been chatting about chatting with his teacher, Mr. J Double L, about how he discovered the fourth tuning. So the tuning that I use, I'll go through it in a second in case anyone doesn't know. Um, and he says everything he now everything now suddenly makes sense. But he's asking, could I quickly um, describe some of the drawbacks and some of the advantages? I don't think he actually writes advantages, but there are advantages, so I'll go through those as well because the whole thing is set up to be an advantage in many respects, and it relates to what we were talking about last week. Uh, in terms of fretboard visualization, but I'll definitely go through some of the drawbacks because there are quite a few of them. Um, so force tuning, uh, a lot of you guys have heard me cover this before, so I'll do it fairly quickly, uh, is E, A, D, G, so the same as you guys so far, and then C instead of B and F instead of E. So that basically means that, and I'm trying not to do this at the moment, uh, there we go, um, um, it basically means that all of the, uh, the intervals between the strings are all perfect fourths. So E to A is a fourth, A to D is a fourth, D to G is a fourth, G to C is a fourth, and C to F is a fourth. Normally you guys would have a, a major third between G and B, which is what these guys are tuned at. Yeah, if you've done the relative tuning thing where you do the... Uh, yeah. You gotta, you know, you tune into back. the fifth fret and then... Exactly. You've got to move back, essentially you won't have to do that. Right? So you guys, uh, I don't know how well you could see, because Dan's fretboard is slightly off the, off the oh. stream there. Sorry, that's my fault, Dan, for not positioning as well. Uh, so yeah, the fifth fret of each string, and then I, I actually tune to the fifth fret of the G string for my C string. Problem is, uh, say if uh, if you play an E major chord, you'll recognise that shape. If I play an E major chord, yeah, I'm so good at guitar. Jazzy, jazzy, exactly. We didn't have sharp on the top. <laughs> yeah. um, so basically. That means, uh, I just played a G on the top, that shows how much I know. Uh, I was thinking in standard tuning. There's my F sharp. Uh, anybody that doesn't get what I'm saying F sharp, go on my Facebook page and check out a stream, a post that was done yesterday by some friends of mine. It's pretty hilarious. Um, she gets nightmares easily. Uh, well, yeah, don't watch it if you scare easily, because uh, cup, Cupcake, as he calls it, is absolutely cupcake. terrifying. Cupcake, come on. Go back to the chat here. Um, so, it means I can't play all of the open string chords that you guys normally play and associate as being part of guitar vocabulary because all of this stuff, bar chords, none of this works. If you know your cage system, so you've got like an E shape, okay, then an A shape, a G shape, you know, so on and so forth. None of that stuff works anymore. However, the amazing thing about this tuning is a chord shape, this is my C major seven, is exactly the same in any octave and on any string set. Man, my fingers look really weird on this guitar. <laughs> Little tiny fingers. Okay, so any chord shape or any arpeggio or any scale that I play, if I play a, a C major scale, that particular shape is exactly the same wherever I play it, so it makes the guitar symmetrical. So the downsides, because that's one major upside, but the downsides are pretty extensive. Um, First of all, lots and lots of vocabulary other than just chords disappears. If I play a blues, if I play the Stevie Ray Vaughan-esque kind of... Whoa. It's not in E anymore. I'd have to do that in the key of F in order to make it work, which that was in the key of F, so I've got like... And then suddenly I've got to play a C7, which the vocabulary doesn't work anymore. It's not the same country. You lose all your country licks that involve open strings because a lot of them require the top two strings being a B and an E. You lose a ton of guitar vocabulary and repertoire that you would play in, say, a top 40 band or you were going to play in, like, a, a tribute band for, say, it's I don't know, guitar, pick a band. guitar-y stuff that you're losing. I mean, you're going to lose, like, a, like kind of... You Which immediately I mean? brings a smile to my face because <laughs> I wish I could do that. I can't yeah, do any of that know. stuff. It's just impossible for me. Um, so it's it's got big drawbacks. There's a couple of other big drawbacks that people don't necessarily think about straight away. Teaching. If you want to make money teaching, you know, this tuning can be a big problem. If you're someone like me that kind of never really learned to improvise in standard tuning, I know all the kind of chord shapes and stuff in standard tuning. I say all of them. I know all of the basic ones. Um, it's only a difference of one fret, but it makes an enormous difference to you and to the student if you're switching tunings all the time. I used to work for Yamaha teaching, and uh, I had to teach in standard tuning, and my brain was just schizophrenic between the two tunings all the time. So if you want to make a living teaching, 
or you end up having to make a living teaching, this tuning is very, very problematic for you if you're teaching. And then if you're teaching standard notation, I don't know why I always call it standard notation. What other type of notation is there? I don't know. Graphical notation? Do you remember oh, yeah, OK. Old? That's true. Yeah, I hadn't Any thought about that. and Passion Warfare tab book. Very true, actually. I hadn't thought about that. So, yes, yeah, so standard notation does... does like Brian Eno kind of stuff. Yeah. So it's like squiggly lines and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Like that's true, because there is some of that in uh, Alien Love Secrets, isn't there? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, OK, standard notation. Sorry, just went off on one there. Um, if you're dealing with that kind of thing, like, you're teaching it. This is an E. But for you, you know that as an F, you know, you're having to really split your brain into <coughs> two different two different setups, which is just cool with that. Yeah, it's so all the tunes they do are stuff like. Mm. Well, meanwhile, I'm going underneath. So well, you're, teach, going, you're, you're doing gypsy not, jazz, yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> like this. Because then they're just doing the same pattern. I'm yeah, just teaching yeah, yeah. them as it on, off, on, off. Um, but obviously, I couldn't really do that because I'd have to. I wouldn't be able to do it, would I? I'd have to go like... Yeah, it'd be a nine. Yeah, it'd be horrible. You could, you know, you just couldn't do it. Um, and then another thing from, from sort of my perspective that's kind of a problematic thing for this, and obviously when I chose to do, be in this tuning, none of these things featured in or were factors in my life, uh, whereas now they are. When I work for Lick Library, uh, say if my Steely Dan DVD, or in fact any of the DVDs that I do where I have to teach material, I have to retune standard tuning. So for instance, on Friday... I am recording a Joe Satriani style solo for the magazine, Guitar Interactive magazine. And it's essentially a Joe Satriani style solo that I've written. And I wrote it in my tuning, because that's obviously what I do when I write these things is basically I factor in all of the things that Joe Satriani does. So you've got like the pick tapping, you've got the whammy bar there. dives. And I mean, we talked about this last week, uh, not on the stream though. Uh, various other things. What else does he do? Um, you've some got harmonics, some uh, harmonic yeah. stuff. Uh, the obviously the legato thing is I don't know why that didn't come first. Um, so you factor all those things in, and then I'll basically improvise until I find things that work and sound like you know the kind of phrases I would have in there. Then I have to go back and learn the whole thing in standard tuning, and the whole time my brain is screaming to me that I'm playing it wrong. <laughs> It's like the Steely Dan DVD that I did. I did, uh, I think it was seven or eight Steely Dan tunes and learning all those solos in standard tuning and then playing them back and having to teach them. And I'm saying things like, this is the third of an E minor seven chord. And my brain is going, it really isn't the third of it. But of course in standard tuning it is, so it can, can be very problematic. So it's something you really want to bear in mind. Don't just switch because you feel, feel it's something that's gonna make you unique or more unique, I should say, or that you know maybe one aspect of your guitar playing, say your fretboard uh, visualization is gonna be easier. You've really got to think about how you make your money as a guitar player and what it's your goals are. It's a real commitment, isn't it? It's a massive commitment, yeah. And you also get people in the comments saying, you're playing it wrong. Yes, you do. <laughs> I mean, I've had, <laughs> <You're> um, <laughs> I had a video where I was teaching you know, I can't remember what it was. It was something to do with, I think it was um, harmonic major scales for soloing over diminished chords. And, um, oh, that old chestnut. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> say, say this was the chord, C sharp diminished. And I was resolving back down to C major seven. So I had this. That was the sound of the scale. And I resolved to C major seven. Now, if you look at my chord shape, what does that look like, Dan? Uh, like a C minor major seven. Yeah. So somebody posted in the comments. Oh. Yeah, that's, that's what it so. There we go. Like. So if we're playing, Dan and I are playing exactly the same shape now. If you look at, our, I don't know how well you can see this. Maybe if you play it as well, David, the C is that basic C minor major seven. Uh, you can see we're all playing the same shape. Let's see what happens if we play it together. What's really brilliant about that is if anybody joins the stream at that specific <laughs> moment has never seen the guitar hour before, they're like, what the hell sound. are these guys doing? <laughs> um, so essentially you can see they're the same shape as yielded two different chord types. I've got a major seven. Now I've actually had people post on my videos before, even though they've heard this, telling me I'm playing it wrong because I'm playing a C minor major seven. So yeah, you can get some people, it's not like a big deal, but no. you get people telling you you're doing things wrong when you're not. Mm. Anyway, so that's, that's kind of... Um, you know, the, the, the gist of it. So if you've got any, again, any more specific questions, get on the Facebook page. Um, we're gonna struggle a little bit to actually keep uh, a real 
uh, kind of eye on the chat today because it's over here on the laptop. We didn't get time to set the laptop, laptop up basically. We didn't want to keep you guys waiting too long. So um, I might do that in a minute. Uh, so if you've got any questions about that, then feel free to ask away. We've got a couple of questions. Um, do you teach lessons over Skype, Tom? I do, but I haven't got any positions available at all. I'm completely full, unfortunately. So keep asking by email. I get a lot of people asking for Skype lessons, but um, you know, keep asking and at some point I may have a spot free. Okay, so. With the, uh, with the, the the force thing. Yes. Like you said, you, you, there's vocabulary that you said you've lost, not lost as such, because you can still play it, but like that whole, um, all that kind of open stuff. If you were doing like a, a product demo and it was like a, either an amp or a pedal that is geared for that geared, kind of thing. Like, so like a tube screamer or something that's yeah, geared for that kind of like, you know, Steve Rayborn esque, you know, or even if it was like, you know, you get pedals that have certain names that clearly harp back to a certain thing, would you would you tune down for that? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Right. I think you I think you'd have to. It's like if you were reviewing I've never had to do it, but say if I was doing the hot wired pedal, you know, the right. I don't know if you guys know that pedal, the Brent Mason yeah, yeah, yeah. Wampler signature pedal. Um I think you've got to really I mean you've just got to accept it's 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 Okay, so this is the tuning that I play in when I'm playing my stuff. But when you're employed, this so comes it's a back real to what, commitment, isn't it? Really, like to change. Yeah, I mean, it comes back to what you've been talking about. We talked about it last week, or if we didn't talk about it, we intended to talk about talk it. So about this might segue. Kitchen. Yeah, the the guitar hour before the guitar hour that always happens in my kitchen. Um, so we were going to talk about. So correct me if we did talk about this. I don't know if you guys remember this whole idea of wanting to do one thing but having to practice something else because it's what you're employed to do yeah so from we, your perspective briefly, so, I mean I, I recently agreed to do um, a few shows co essentially covering oh, yeah, right. a trombone player yeah and I ha I've sort of agreed to it and I've got to teach myself to read wow, read, wow, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. read ba not to play trombone <laughs> obviously <laughs> but a trombone hour I'll just come in next week um no, to teach myself to read uh, bass clef in a month, um, and it's the it's a it's a quite it's quite an interesting project because it's like a it's like a kids book but there's instruments are in each character, so and it's it's like about going to space and stuff. So the music's quite like there's some whole the, tone stuff and is is the trombone kid really fat? No, well, I I am the trom the trombone <laughs> kid essentially. Just um, just wondering, you know, <laughs> bass clef and all. So yeah, I mean, obviously, I, I you know, I've, I've been saying I want to really get a, a load of standards sort of under my belt, really know them inside out, and you know, be able to reel them off and do solo melody stuff, and really concentrate on that kind of stuff. But there's no money at the end of that rainbow. Whereas at the moment, there's work coming in, and it's like, right, I've got to do that now because I'm getting paid to do that, and I can't turn up and do a shit job because you're being paid. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of it's disrespectful to turn up and go, have you learned the stuff? No, but I can play the shit out of this augmented scale. Well, Do that's I mean? it. I mean, the reason the reason I bring that up is because if I'm playing something in fourth tuning, if I've learned a load of, I can I can kind of improvise whatever in this tuning. If someone then employs me to do something that requires standard tuning, I've just got to grit my teeth and do it. And it happens all the time. So although I say this is kind of a dilemma, you shouldn't really change. I always tell my students not to tune in fourths, which might seem a bit weird because it makes things easier. Yeah. Um, it's it's something that if you do tune in force and you've been playing a while, you still be able to tune back to. It's only a tuning; just just tune, tune it back down again for yeah. for anything you require that you know needs to be in standard tuning. It's just a ball ache because if you've been doing it, like I I learned the the fretboard in force tuning, so I don't know the fretboard like you guys do in standard tuning so at all. Do you ever have days where you regret regret making that choice? Yeah, every time I turn up to Lick Library and have to teach <laughs> something in standard tune. Every day in my life. Tune. Yeah. Um, there's two things I regret. The first is ordering guitars, not this one, but ordering guitars without fretboard markers on. Right. Because as you've, you've, you've experienced, it's like you have to stick fretboard markers. We have these, in fact, I got a, an email about this the other day asking me where I got my fretboard markers from, which I thought was quite amusing. Um, Seeing as they are literally just stickers from Staples or something that gets stuck, yeah. it's pretty obvious, really. But we stick them on because you know it's harder to keep track of where everything is on a guitar with no. I mean, this thing is perfect because the the inlays are so huge. I used to have one of these, and they're just amazing guitars. And you've got the one with the fine tuners as well, which is the better one, in my opinion. Except I've never used them. No, nor did I. No, they're and just, I don't know. They're just bottomed out because I don't know my tech guy just. I think. Oh, he's screwed them right down. Yeah. Has he? 
they they released another one without the fine tuner bridge on and everyone right. said it wasn't as good so that's kind of interesting um but yeah it's it's just one of those things you just have to deal with you know when you're employed you have to do the job that's been specified to you and get on with it without moaning like yeah. i make sure i never moan to anybody that you know if i'm doing a job i don't go up to like the the owner of liquor and go why won't you let me do this in force tuning that's just not how it works well, you can't I mean uh, you can't really moan about being a musician for a living anyway to anyone that isn't a musician really it's very true and even so if it's an out of work musician they'll be like shut up you've got a gig you know yeah. whereas you can't go to like a a bricky that's done you know a 12 hour day you know moving like proper labouring and like doing more probably more work in a day than I've done in my entire life we're sat there just mm. strumming and I'm like, oh, oh, you know, oh. This couldn't be I easier. Think my advice would be generally when people have asked me about this um, on a couple of occasions, um, the answer would be like if you already have learnt your root notes, then and you've got a, a good number of your sort of basic scales quite comfortable, then maybe don't. Well, don't change. Too late for you. Um, <laughs> it's probably too late. Like I sort of vaguely when I you know versus what you were yeah. doing, I was toying with it, and at that point, I already knew. So you're the exact kind of guy I would say bad idea don't, don't do it don't do because it. it just doesn't make any sense because yeah. you already know yeah. so much of the fretboard and your whole mindset is based around that it'd be like changing religions or something it'd be like that kind of completely that massive thing yeah. to, 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 even it's just those two strings but yeah. effectively a culture shock it would I, just I can be see the, the the benefits from a like a single line point of view which is why like bass bass players if they, if they get goes up to a c or yeah yeah they have I imagine it's it a bass player on, tuning right? effectively yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah and obviously they're not playing like big chords are they you know you're not going to see no I, mean, I don't even know there's probably someone on YouTube somebody's playing like a well they tend to play the, like the biggest thing they'll play is a triad yeah like little yeah, yeah. those kind of shapes basically yeah. yeah various versions of that yeah essentially um, I can see the, the, the advantages of it there but yeah because I, can, I can go back the, the whole thing is the standard guitar tuning we're going on about this too long now we'll change question in a minute but um we got a really cool question after this as well. Uh, the whole thing with guitar was it as an accompaniment instrument originally, where you would play those kind of. Again, apologies, guys. You would uh, you you would play these. Yeah. As you can hear, there are ways of playing those chords. They're just not as cool. And you can't you can play bar chords like this. It's not a bar chord, obviously, but I think my guitar might be clipping a little bit. Sorry, guys. Um, so yeah, there's ways around stuff. You know, it's just just whatever. It's it's. One of those things, there's a few guys who do it. Alex Hutchins does it, amazing, amazing player. I'm sure you guys have all heard of him. Um, and Stanley Jordan was one of the big proponents originally of it. You guys can probably name a few more guys that do it. There's a few, um, a guy called Ant Law, just a fantastic jazz player. Certainly for jazz guys, it's a very, very useful thing. If you are playing any other styles, I'm not sure it's really worth it, to be honest. Um, so there we go, that answers that one. Next question, which we can all chip on a bit more because it's not related to something specifically that I do. Um, it's from Justin Bulmer. I don't know if Justin's watching. If he's not, uh, when he does watch it, hi Justin, hope you're well. Hello. Uh, Justin basically is asking uh, an interesting question that's kind of a two-part question, which is basically how do you relax or learn to relax in two scenarios? First is from a technical perspective, when you're playing live versus playing in your studio at home or in your bedroom at home or whatever, how do you get the same technical facility uh, that you would have in your studio or bedroom. Uh, you've probably all noticed this, that when you do gigs, the adrenaline's running, you feel the pressure and stuff, and then suddenly you find that your uh, technique is not what it was before. Not necessarily from an improvisational perspective, but just generally your technique suffers a bit more on gigs. And then the second part of the question, which I find even more interesting, is how do you learn to relax and take your t not take your time so much, but just get better at sight reading, not standard notation, mm -hmm and charts, okay, so two different things there, and I can kind of chip in on this. Uh, I have a few techniques for, for doing this, but I don't know if you guys have got anything, any advice in particular, or any, even just experiences of this happening, so that Justin doesn't feel like he's the only guy that this ever happens to. Uh, or advice, think, whichever. I think, I think with, the, with the, like the reading thing and charts, I think there is, there is a strange kind of, uh, sort of otherworldly little mindset you have to get into. You can overthink it and end up tripping yourself up whereas it's, you sort of have to get it to the it kind of does it itself you see what I mean like with, with the because I like I've, I've been doing the trying to read this bass club thing and it's sort of it's removing that little stutter of oh what's that or where is that and by the time you've done that it's too late they're not totally gone do you know what I mean yeah same with chord charts yeah uh, or getting yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah getting, it, getting it to the point where um, it's 
I think with any of these things, it's getting to the point where it's it's better than it needs to be to do the job, so that when you do the job, you can relax a little bit and it still comes out. You don't really want to be on the edge the entire time. Very true. Um, I mean, my reading is not as good as it should be, but some of those things you sort of don't you don't do it unless you need to do it as a guitar player because yeah. you you don't need it to communicate on the instrument initially anyway. Certainly not in that the styles that you often find yourself playing. And um, I find my reading goes up and down depending on what I'm doing. Um, oh right. I've got so I, I have somewhat of a classical background and that I did sort of grades early yeah. on and um, and that occasionally do like weddings uh, sort of solo. Right, and you're stuff. reading that the entire time. Well, or yeah, we need it's to, kind of half and half. It's, it's it's sort of half and half. It's like tunes that I stand in standards uh, pieces yeah, yeah, yeah. that I don't know and that you know I'm familiar with, but then filling out the time, you do have to then read some as well. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And if around, if we try to keep it around sort of grade four to six level sort of pieces, I think they sort of like stumble my way through the background in the weather and it's, it's not incredible by any means. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's sort of background. But as I do more stuff, of that through the summer sometimes, then my reading. Um, more imp improved and then as the winter comes around it dies yeah, off yeah I mean I once um, this, is, this is probably uh, a decent analogy I do come up with some right <laughs> tosh <laughs> some corkers <laughs> this, I kind of say things like well I guess with anything but especially with reading is it's kind of like you know if you uh, if you like knock a balloon up it'll go up and then it'll slow oh, it's like it. coming back down yeah. I and like kind that of, you've got a kind of, spinning plates kind of vibe yeah you've got to kind of knock it back up again otherwise if you don't do it it's just so yeah. you know it's always that sinking again I think with guitar players as well we tend to learn to play first and then that's one, maybe one of the issues that when you try to read you've, you've got this you've got frustration go crawling of, like a child you know, yeah. it's just it's very it can be perhaps frustrating because you have the facility to play but you're trying to learn that's so far and above your knowledge of perhaps the staff and just how to and of course we've got multiple octaves to play well multiple places to play the exact same notes yeah. which is a nightmare yeah. and, um, there's one book I'd recommend um, that I teach from that's written with um, a sort of intermediate technical player in mind but has never read before and that would be uh, Music Reading for Guitar by David Oakes it's a oh, Musicians right. Institute one I don't know that one it's very well written like well presented well printed and um, it's, 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 it assumes that you've been playing maybe for a year or two you, you have some technical facility but you've never read a dot. Right. And it takes you through using um, non, it doesn't use jazz or rock melodies, it uses classical melodies, and it takes you through for sync pretty um, comprehensively through single line notation it's reading. It's a funny thing with the, the, it's very the reading thing for guitar because you can quite easily get hold of things to read. Like, um, you know, you can get hold of anything that's, that's kind of in pitch, you know, like flute pieces mm -hmm. or violin. Yeah, but clarinet's great because it's in the same. It's the same pitch range as a yeah. guitar, effectively. Um, but they're not always. It's not. It's not kind of realistic stuff. Like you'll read that kind of stuff. And think, oh, okay, and then you'll get a chart that is written um, like a pop chart or something. And because of the way pop music is played, yeah. it's just a completely different thing. It's not yeah. all nice tidy eighth notes one after another. It's not just a key signature. It's you know, there's all this other stuff going on. Or if you do like a show, like a theatre show or something, like a uh, musical or something like that. Some of the stuff that comes out in that, I mean, I got a gig doing West Side Story once, and that was like yeah, the I've worst done that as well. thing ever. Yeah, I've done it ever. as well. And all the swung eights, we've t I'm sure we've talked about this before on the stream, but all the swung eights are written as dotted eighth, dotted eighth, that's in the sixteenth note, so on and so forth. It's just these chords that are written, and it's like if you played them, they'd be like this kind of yep, stuff, like, and you just, you it's just can't nightmare. do them. I remember that very clearly. I mean, let me, let me see if I can give you guys some specific tips on how to practice this stuff because there's a couple of things that are really useful. Um, I'm just gonna, let's see if this works. I've never done this before, so let's just try. Yes. Yeah. Ooh. Okay, there we go. So, so you see this, see this chart. Um, let's say you were presented with that chart, not on a gig, but just you, you had to, let's say you were practicing your sight reading. Uh, some little tips for you. One of the things that people run into problems with is immediately trying to get all the information in at the same time. So let's say we're reading the chords rather than reading the notation. We'll get onto the notation in a second, onto the melody. Um, first thing I would do is basically I would read through all of those chords and make them all have a, a whole note or a kind of, make them all last for four beats. So if I was reading through that, hopefully you guys can, yeah, you can still see the webcam at the top. Rather than read through it like, uh, effectively going one, two, three, four, a one, two, three, four, a one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, so on and so forth. Just make everything four beats. Allow yourself the time to look at the next chord. But when those when those four beats are going by, move your eye onto the next chord. 
don't wait till you finish that chord to look at the next one. So I'm going to play C major seven as soon like you can't see. I've got like an eye tracker on the screen or something. But as soon as I've looked at that chord and I've started playing it, I'm looking at the next one. So I've got one, two, looking at C minor seven. Now looking at F seven. Sorry, I should be like for four beats. So now looking at F seven. Now looking at B flat major seven. Now I'm looking at B flat minor seven. Now I'm looking at E flat seven. And notice all of these are four beats long. Okay, I'm not playing the correct amount of time for each chord, that can come later. I'm just playing through the chord chart as it is, uh, as if everything was four beats long. Now that process can be used, this, you can do the same thing with your standard notation. So for instance, I could play just the rhythm, but play everything on the same note. So I'm only reading the rhythm as opposed to reading all of the information at the same time. So if I, I'm gonna play everything on a, on a C. If I counted myself in, if I had one, two, three, mistake as well sorry guys um, but you would read through in that way just reading the rhythm and then you could read all of the notes as quarter notes or half notes so you might just read now this is just the notes I'm not playing the rhythm at all I might just read and again every time I play a note I'm looking at the next note along I'm not staring at the note that I'm playing I'm looking at the next note Okay, and by doing that you're developing this ability to see ahead. You're thinking ahead like a chess player would think ahead in terms of thinking moves ahead. You're learning to look further forward in the score. And like, I guess you guys do the same thing when you're sight reading. You're always looking, you're never looking at the bit that you're on, you're always looking, in some cases guys look two or three bars ahead. Like if yeah. they really good read, I mean, I, I probably like, look um, two or three notes ahead, probably. Like Ronnie O'Sullivan, or uh, he's like playing snooker, you're like four yeah. shots ahead or chess. Exactly. It's like, you, you know. It's a strategic, uh, approach that's going to allow you to become better at this kind of fairly complex uh, complex thing um, and you can do that with any chord chart if I just like, would, you, would you just say it's, it's better um, to have some kind of tempo driving you along it's better to do it uh, really you know like not embarrassingly slow but like a really slow tempo and do it in one continuous thing well, it, there is no such thing as embarrassingly slow well no yeah, yeah I don't, I, that's what I mean but um, yeah. the, because it, it'd be easier to try and do it at a faster tempo and then have to stop and check something. Whereas mm. once you've pressed play, that's it then until you've got through it. So there's two schools of thought for this that I've heard of. One is that yes, you should have the time-based pressure because that's what would happen on a real gig. Mm. My thought process is in, in, in initially forget it, just, just yeah, try yeah. and find the stuff. Because like for instance, by the, by the time I've got this Anna Maria tune, um, which actually Martin and I recorded on the album that we're releasing, just a little plug for that, that's coming out fairly soon. Um, if you're gonna read something like this, obviously you're already at the level where you should be able to kind of be able to look at the next chord and find it fairly quickly. So at that point, I would have some kind of metronome involved. If you're reading through, let's go to all the things you are again up here. If you're reading through this for the first time and you've never read chord charts particularly to a great extent, it might take you 30 seconds to find F minor seven. Yeah. Yeah. And at this point, by the way, we're not worried about the kind of voicings that you're playing. I would stick with what they call shell voicings at this point, which is root, third, and seventh. And you're just literally taking as long as you require to find the next chord. But again, it's this whole thing of give yourself the strategic advantage. I almost couldn't say that word. Strategic advantage of don't stare at the chord that you're on. Like, once you've once beat one's happened and you've got the chord, you've got, such a you've got two, three, four to be looking what's next. Absolutely. You don't go like... One, two, three, four, and then yeah, but it's, people do. It's easy to get paralysed by that, though. I think a lot of my students do that in that there are so many options. Okay, not initially, but even if you're somewhat more like you're beyond the very basics, because you can go into other positions and play the same exact note. Yeah, making making those decisions can be one of those things that stops people from moving their eyes along. Mm. Um, what you could do on something like this tune, where you've got pretty much. Um, geographically the same like four bars yes. per line yep. is read like say bar one and then to get your eyes moving then go straight on to bar five then just the one okay yeah so just I may not be explaining this very well but you could force your eyes to make bigger jumps bigger leaps around the page um, and now this obviously is not useful because <laughs> you're never going to do this but it trains the eye to just be darting around a little bit more than 
Hayley perhaps would be if you're just staring frozen on each bar one at a time uh, in the normal way of leaning on yeah it makes sense yeah you could you could do any numbers combination as well like have a little grid and go from one to eight then just to get used to moving yeah right just around so you're not staring there's an interesting question here as well i'll be interested in what you guys think about this because i have quite an unorthodox approach to this which is not necessarily a good approach um because i don't teach sight reading hardly ever um how do you decide which area of the neck to play in when sight reading now when i do this i'm a bad boy i just start somewhere usually in the middle of the neck and I will use any some kind of weird awkward fingering to get me around um, I'm not a position based reader I don't know about you guys I was only I mean uh, you've probably been taught differently because you said you got a bit of a classical but oh, of course I, yeah. I just kind of got taught um, if you put your first finger over the fifth fret second finger six third finger seven and then you kind of learn which notes are under these fingers Absolutely. Yeah. you can kind of and then you allow yourself one fret that way so mm -hmm. essentially the range is from here chromatically up to here which is kind of most tunes unless it really darts around you know but reading like uh, standards and stuff you can get most stuff out of that just that little that little position mm. and you start start learning that all right you know i've got a d under that finger an a under that finger and then you can kind of go from there and you allow yourself so uh, like a B you go to there or, you know kind of allow yourself one fret either way and then you can, you can do it without looking then so you're not the temptation is if it if it goes say uh, D to uh, G some guys might go and then just do, okay, yeah, jump, do, do you know what yeah. I mean like some, some you know unnecessary jump or once you go out of position you can kind of end up Going, well, I don't really know. I don't really know what's out there. You see what I mean? You kind of. So I was just kind of taught that one little place and then I've just sort of taken it from there. I was just wondering if there's some bark kicking around somewhere. I don't know where it is though. It's probably in a pile of stuff down there. Well, there's why. a book that I used um, when I was kind of shedding to go on ships called. I think it's called Sight Reading for the Contemporary Guitar Player, I think. Right. And the way that is laid out is you've got. Various, it, it, it kind of it does it in keys to start with. I'm not sure. I can't remember if it gets sort of chromatic or anything like that later on. But say it'll, it'll start in C, and then it'll be positional based stuff, and it'll kind of be the same melody, and it'll say right, play that in positions one and three or whatever, and then it'll get a bit more difficult, a bit more diff rhythmic, and then the last couple of examples are positional again, but more than one note. So you're reading like two or three notes. So you kind of get used to doing like a piano player would, and you know it's it's a lot of sort of little. Um, like little sort of triad movements and stuff like that, so you kind of get used to seeing which notes are moving and which ones aren't. And I've not done that kind of stuff for a while, but it was it's quite a useful book. So out of interest, let's just uh, show you guys this. Um, taking that first phrase, where would you guys play that phrase? Uh, uh, up the uh, different up the octave rather than down in that octave. So if you're going to play it in like a, right. say you were playing a chord melody version. So where are you starting? I always you're... gravitate to the middle of the note. Me too. Yeah, so that's really interesting. Yeah. So I would play that here. Yeah. You guys are the same. Perhaps, yeah. It's because you you're in you're in the middle and you can jump either way with relative ease then into that octave. Well, know, of course. So that, that's the thing. That whole first phrase all fits within that small area of the neck. Yeah. yeah. So I think again, there's like an experience thing that comes into it, and this is a slightly annoying answer because. The experience thing can only be learnt by doing lots and lots and lots of it and failing quite a few times. Yeah. So you know, there's no magic. They call it a magic bullet. I think they call it. Uh, no, there's no magic, magic answer to this. I don't know what they call it. Magic bullet. What is it? Mm -hmm. well, what you used for making smoothies or whatever. I've no idea. Um, I actually, that magic formula. Magic, magic formula will do. Magic formula. There's no magic formula for this in terms of how I mean, to I, approach. I tend to go off either the highest or the lowest note if you can kind of look at it and go right well it gets pretty oh, yeah, you can yeah. quite you know you can, if you look at it and there's loads of you know ledger lines for days yeah. you know you're not going to be able to get it down there you're going to have to kind of go somewhere else um, mm -hmm. but even then you know sorry there's an interesting thing here uh, Tim Wing 8 studying functional harmony changed the way I look at, looked at sight reading I started hearing things when looking at the page which is kind of interesting that's very true as well you know when you see a line um, after a while you've been playing long enough you can sort of hear almost like sight singing. I've never been good at sight singing, but you can hear the line, um, which is very important. And in fact, fact, that can cause issues for me sometimes. If I've heard, I don't know if you guys have experienced this, but if I've heard a particular recording of a song, so this used to happen with When Sunny Gets Blue all the time. I'd heard Kurt Rosenwinkel's version from East Coast Love Affair. I think it was on East Coast Love Affair. And the way he phrases the melody, when I look at the chart and read the chart, I want to play it the way he oh, yeah, yeah. 
yeah. has played but, it. Yeah. And then I'm reading the notation and I'm trying, I'm actually trying to squeeze notes that aren't on the chart in there and getting very confused because it doesn't look or sound the way that his original version does. That's another thing with, with reading as well. I, th I think if you can already, if you can already play a little bit, you might sort of, you're, you're kind of in that fight between actually reading it and then what you think it's going to sound like. So you might jump to, you might just play something because you think, oh, that's how it goes. And then when you actually look at it and go, oh no, that's not, that's not quite how it goes. So well, I mean, it, yeah, in, in between actually reading it and letting your ears there's, there's, just take over and play what you think it's going to be. Absolutely. There's another weird phenomenon as well. Like um, when I did some a load of gigs with Adam Nitti, um, his charts are really, really complicated. Yeah, I've seen some really, really yeah. hardcore kind of fusion stuff. And so I, I knew I was going to do the gig, so I learned the charts. But unless they were in front of me, I couldn't play them. That's where I'm not. I'm, I'm not reading stuff. them. Though. I'm not. I'm not reading it. But you, you sort of see, you see four bars, and if you didn't have the chart, you couldn't play it. It's but weird. when you've got the chart in front of you, you're not actually Experience reading is, it. Yeah, absolutely. I don't it's know what bizarre. that is. It's like a, it's like a prompt almost. Yeah. You can sort of see the shape of it and something to do with we half and half something you know. of an issue with well I know I have an issue with just like memorising things and reading things at the moment with standards and yeah you know, I can't I just, remember anything yeah you, you're the same <laughs> you're well, I forgot to bring a guitar to this <laughs> yeah, I mean. yeah Dan forgot to bring a guitar it's bad news I'd say one more thing about like um, sight reading and me reading music as well try to it might help to cut yourself some slack I mean guitarists have a horrendous reputation for reading um, so even if you can do a bit of it and you can uh, I'm not not saying don't work on it or don't practice, but just having the having a good musical reading level is different to say just sight reading go yeah, there to do absolutely. it perfect. I mean, I think it's much more useful as a working perhaps contemporary musician to be able to read uh, read music quite well, be able to work things out quickly. You know, when you say second or third go through, but it's kind of core skills, isn't it? It's, yeah, it's don't not put just... pressure on yourself where you've just got to be absolute bang on perfect the first time and we've, we've talked before about how there's this myth that's perpetuated that, that people you know theatre gigs for instance you walk in two seconds later oh, sorry two seconds before the curtain goes up they give you the chart it's not the case the only person I know that's happened to is you on cruise ships yeah I mean the, wor the worst it, it got I mean like when for instance the cruise ship thing when, when you join a the ship there's maybe two or three production shows in a cruise so say the cruise is ten days long three of those days will be different production shows that are set every time so the, the, it's like played to tracks and it's kind of like a 70 30 it's supposed to be 70 30 like the band is supposed to be 70 and the tracks are 30 right. it's never like that but um so they're the same every time so you get given all this music at the beginning, beginning of the week so you can kind of go through it anyway and time. the tracks there so you can kind of you know yeah i think you we can talked sort about of that like, before, yeah. you know you can get out of some stuff but the most difficult thing was uh guest entertainers which fly onto the ship um, so they'll join at whatever port it is midway through the cruise. I was going to say, I thought you meant like, you know, like aircraft carrier style. No, like, like with a, hanging off with like a the whole rope ladder, <laughs> like Chuck Norris. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and that would be you turn up to rehearsal at four o'clock and you get given the music and you've got 15, 20 minutes while the sound checking the mics and going through the lighting until you're just rehearsing it then and there. So that's kind of, that's the, wor that's the worst it's ever got. And then not really I've never been massively caught out with anything usually there's a gap between that rehearsal as long as you get the tune doesn't you know the wheels don't fall off completely I think what happens is later on you can look at it in your room a little bit and go over the little, little bits but like some of the advice I've been given is uh, not like I ever have to do this but some of the advice I've been given is go through the chart look at the the points that might screw you up where are the repeat marks beginnings and endings where are, yeah where are the so code where's the know. coda where does the you know any, any, any of the points, like if there's first and second time ending, so on and so forth. Because the worst thing that could happen to you is you get completely lost within the chart. One thing I would really, really recommend you start doing if you don't already do this is buy scores for things, buy scores for transcriptions of solos, buy scores for musicals, even Just if you hate music. I, I'm not a musical fan. If you can, but yeah, well, yeah, that's no. I don't mean I don't I mean like do that, I don't mean get your tights on. I mean <laughs> the music, the music that they hire for these things is the yeah. same as the professional shows a lot of the absolutely, time. Absolutely, absolutely. So yeah. I mean, I've got scores for like hairspray and stuff. Yeah, and I've got operas and stuff in there, and you you open them up, and as the music's going, read through them, see if you can follow them, because that skill is really really useful in terms of just knowing what's being able to say if you do get lost one thing that a skill that's really useful to have is to be able to recognize and this comes back to what uh what wing eight was saying in terms of being able to recognize a phrase on the page is being able to hear say there's a little a little piccolo part in a in an opera or something or whatever you know being able to pick that out on the score and then find your 
you're, you're grounding within score again, know where you are. I kind of think it's really easy to practice. You just sit there and do it. And you can start with things like, again, Bach, you know, uh, educate yourself on uh, some classical music, you know, uh, if you're not already into it. There's some amazing uh, stuff out there that you can listen to and get all the scores for for free. You know, it's all copyright free stuff. So, you know, Scroll go get yourself on this. Google. Just find, <laughs> yeah, exactly. They've all been dead long enough that no one cares anymore. Yeah. Um, get yourself on Google and just, you know, get the scores. They're all for, all for free on the internet. And then go on YouTube or go on Spotify or whatever and try and follow along with the scores and it will actually improve your musical ability, musicianship and your ability to read as well. So that's quite useful. Even like the, the sort of pop stuff, if yeah. you're, if you've got like a, you know, like a, if you've got a big theatre thing, like a hairspray or something and say there's like a, a certain chord or something or a certain bit that comes up or like, you know, a two, four bar or, you know, any of those little, little sort of significant things, like if, if you just learn, I mean, if you just learn what a certain chord sounds like, and then if you get a bit lost, you can go, oh, that sounded like a, you know, a seven sharp nine or something. Oh, there's one. We're probably around here now. And then you can sort of get back in. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of stuff like that really are. There's a, there's a few different skills, I guess, we're, we're sort of talking about. Here, and and um, definitely separating out the time element and the note element um, is, is very important. And then I think when you have that, then maybe try getting through it, like you were saying. Um, so Rhythm, you can like rhythms learn to, massively. So you can learn to mess up, but don't drop the beat. Yeah. Make sure you can follow, so you can then get all the way through it. So there's a few different levels of perhaps how you could approach something when you're reading it for the first time. Um, well, even you know, if it's not the first time. But, um. So that's sight reading. The second part of the question was to do with technique when you're playing before. live. I don't know, like again, either if you guys want to talk about, because I've got some specific things, but if you guys want to talk about when that's happened to you and how you dealt with it, or if you've got any tips on it. I think it's quite a hard one to have tips on, to be honest, but I've got a couple of things. But I, t I told um, you about that time on the ship where I had to do that Julian Banjo. Yeah, it was amazing. You can tell me again. Completely bend it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's going to happen. You're going to, as Dan says, bend, bend things it. From, bend it. from time to time. Um, um, yeah, well, I, on the subject of kind of uh, relaxing when you're playing and stuff like that, and not getting stressed out and like making your technique drop because you're sort of really tense or, you know, you're trying too hard or whatever. It's just a little. I mean, you've, if you've seen the guitar a few times, you've probably heard this story too many times. But just in case, um, so it was just part of the. Oh, you've, you've probably not heard this anyway. So, so there's there's a there's a, a, a comedian that comes on on the ship, and this sort of intro show. They do like five minutes each, and he did this. He sort of had an acoustic guitar and did kind of like a few like funny songs and stuff. And he was doing this bit where he pretends he can't play and he's trying to play uh, uh, La Bamba, and he just keeps messing it up. And then uh, he plays. Uh, the Julian Banjo's thing. He says, here's one for the Arkansas folk or whatever, because the ship was, I think, out of, I think the ship was out of Alabama at that time. And uh, he plays the, uh, uh, and then I'm supposed to play it from the, the side of the stage at the pit, and it's like this thing is like, oh, you know, uh, sort of just give me five minutes to spank Junior over here or whatever. I think that's the line he says. To spank Junior? Spank Junior, yeah. What kind of a show is this? <laughs> uh, it's from the show, from the show. Um, so uh, yeah, and it's I'm supposed to he's supposed to sort of play this like terrible you know he sort of, he goes oh follow this and plays this terrible little thing. It's like and a I'm cross, supposed crossroads to, moment. Yeah, exactly, basically. exactly that. Mm -hmm. So I'm supposed to get up and you know do this kind of rock and roll shred thing or whatever. And I got so nervous the first time, sort of stood up and uh, I think I got this bit right. And yeah. after, after that, black towel. You mean you like, were nervous after you'd gone? Yeah. No, was... because I think I I, I thought. Right, this has got to be really rock and roll. I've got to play really fast. I've got to do all this stuff. Got to get your legs as far apart as possible. I know, it's just, it's just so. I just got so nervous that I could not remember where anything was. And you know that thing where yeah, yeah. you're just trying to play fast. Yeah. But the 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 this. Mind... Oh god. It was, I think I did the thing where you know you miss a bend. I went. Yeah. <laughs> it's the worst. It was so it was just so bad. And I mean, after that, I had like I sort of you know sort of took. Uh, sort of redemption the week after and like did you know kind of came up with a few things like I'll definitely do that I'll definitely do that I'll end with that and uh, it was fine and it went really well but oh, just that it's your own worst enemy I think I think just don't worry about it wow. try and relax and think about other things try and worry now, about you know other things rather than the technical aspects of it and trying to play everything right you know so the, pr the problem is and I don't disagree with you in any way at all but the problem is it's much easier said than done yeah yeah so the way I always sort of talk about this is and this is from personal experience 
I'm sure we've talked about this on the guitar hour before as well, but not necessarily in relation to this. So the thing I would do, if, if you can, is I would put yourself in a situation which is more pressured than the situation you're having an issue with. Now that sounds totally counterintuitive. You're thinking, well, hang on, if I can't play, say you'd say you'd, you're nervous every time you go to a jam session, for instance, which people do, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They can be quite pressurized situations. You feel like you've got to play something really kind of the, your best stuff or whatever. So you get up on stage and you're really nervous, and then that perpetuates. You become more and more nervous every time you do it. If you put yourself in a scenario that's kind of more high pressure than that, um, you'd have to figure out that would be unique for each person. So maybe you do... I'm join the... Firefighters or something? I don't, well, no, no, a musical scenario. I'm not, oh, saying, okay. All right. I'm not saying go and rescue. <laughs> Jump out of a plane. Yeah, I'm not saying go and rescue kittens from trees. Um, but you know, um, it's one of those things. If you can find something that's a musically more pressurized environment for you, then the thing that you found nerve wracking beforehand seems insignificant in comparison. So, like for instance, me playing at trade shows in front of fifty baying guitar players who can't wait for you to make a mistake means that when I go and do, I don't know, some other kind of gig, you know, that's more kind of less pressurized, it just doesn't factor in my mind at all. Um, so I'm just looking, it's, uh, that, that's the first thing, trying to put yourself in that scenario. The other thing is, I would say that, be aware that in terms of your technique, if you can, so say your highest level of technique you achieve is here, okay, I don't know what this number is, it's 100, whatever, your level of uh, technique on your gig maybe is 70 or whatever but the minimum amount of technique that you require to be able to execute your music is say 50 so there's this there's this big buffer okay so if you practice stuff to the point and this just involves playing and practicing a lot a huge amount to get the technique up to the point where it's comfortable enough that if you have 30 percent of your technique knocked off you can still play <laughs> So one of the things I was always conscious of with my legato playing, because that's the thing I always have to do, it's the thing that people always want me to do, is that, you know, so we're, we're in a, a live scenario right now. If I mess this up, it's going to be there forever. But the thing is, I'm not, yeah. <laughs> and then I've got him going, scrub, scrub. The thing is, I'm not nervous about it, because I've done this so many times in front of people, you know, what's the worst thing that's going to happen if it screws up? It's not the, like the Dr. Pepper I think Pepper there's, that thing, there's that thing of thinking, Oh, if I play a wrong note, that's it. I'm the worst guitar player ever. Do you know what I mean? Or if you do, if, and of if course, you do soloing and you do a bend that's out of tune, or you hit the wrong note, or whatever, you bend up to the wrong note, you think, and you can properly beat yourself up about wrong. Is that long wit? Long whip, whip, long whip. Thank you for joining the stream. Thank you so much. But I mean, it's just one of those things. You know, you have to. You just got to let it go. You, yeah, you've got because nobody else cares if you make. I mean, as long as you don't keep perpetually. The thing is, mistakes. if you you know, as long as you don't let it ruin the gig and everything else is is great. You know what I mean? You don't concentrate as a guitar player. You don't concentrate on the ninety nine percent of it that was really good. Or there's nothing wrong with if you're feeling that way inclined that the, unless of course you have to perform a specific part. Like I, I get way more nervous for gigs if I've got specific things I have to play. Yeah. Like if I had to play. Uh, Peaches on Regalia, for instance. You guys know that tune? Da, 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 da. And I had to play that specific part. It's written, and I had to play it exactly, and it's very hard to play. I'd be way more nervous than if I had to improvise. Uh, but let's say we're on improvisation style gig, and you find, I used to find this all the time, I'd improvise solos, and my technique would die. Um, there's nothing wrong with just taking a bit more time to uh, relax and just allow yourself to play some more melodies. You know, if, you're, if you've got this kind of vibe going on, you don't always have to be... You know, it doesn't always have to be that. It's a really obvious thing to say, but if you're if your heart's racing and every time you think about playing fast, you're you know feeling stressed about it, allow yourself just to play. Wait till you you've calmed down a little bit, till you allow yourself to feel a little bit more comfortable, and then go for something else. And each time you feel more and more, if you feel sort of nervous about it, just again, allow yourself to kind of relax again, get to the point where you feel relaxed and comfortable, where your hands feel warm, your hands feel comfortable, and then just try a little bit of it. You know, you don't have to go all out. It's kind of irrelevant. You know, you, you, you just have to do enough that's comfortable for you. And over the course of however many months or years of doing these kind of scenarios, you'll just start to feel more and more comfortable with it. The worst thing you can do 
is make the situation 10 times worse by always going for the stuff that's the most complicated, the hardest to pull off, the most technically difficult, and screwing it up every time. Because those are the kind of gigs where you walk off stage and question whether you should even be playing the instrument anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're awful, I've had loads of them, you know, uh, loads and loads of gigs like that. They don't tend to happen so much anymore because, again, those two things are sort of developed the technique to the point where it feels comfortable. I, I can play what I need to play at 70% of my technique level, you know. If I'm having a really good day, 95% might happen, and then it's like, okay, this is this feels amazing. You know, this feels really good, and you get gigs like that. Uh, most of the time, it's probably 70%, but it's getting that technique to the point where it is 70% is acceptable. It's just getting it like reliable, isn't it? You know what I mean? It's things like, like are they getting picking reliable, or like you're working on the uh, the sort of swing, swing, sort swing of, eighth note, thing, yeah, uh, which is just a nightmare. So trying to get that reliable and that that. Uh, Real thing that uh, I can sort of trouble with and I have to play. Oh, I ask that up near enough every time I play it. Yeah, and it's okay. I've got to record you, that as well. You're, you're allowed to get things wrong on gigs. You know, it's live. It's not. And the other thing like this is, as well. That this isn't a small thing. But if you're if you do all your practice hunched over your guitar, sat down, and then you go That's to a, a gig point, and you've yeah. got to do yeah, it stood up. To mention that. It's so like say. embrace the necklace. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> because, absolutely. Straps that. Because got that full metal mouth. Because <laughs> yeah. if you practice all the time sitting down like yep. this, you've got this. The guitar is sort of around the under the there. under the boob. Yeah, <laughs> and um, and that if if you get your whatever it is, the guitar picking doesn't matter whatever it, it it might be, but to that to a certain level, say you get you talk about just the a levels. certain chord shape, you'll start to stand up and go, oh right, I can't do that anymore. Do you know what I mean? Because if yeah. you're like doing, you know, giving it this or whatever. If you've got it at a, if you if your level is say um, sitting down at whatever 100 and then you know standing up it can drops a third drops even, even more <laughs> because um so yeah i mean getting getting over not looking cool I guess. there's other you know, things you can do when you stood up as well i mean <laughs> um, like if you oh, i can't really demonstrate this very well but when you when you stood up with the guitar you can angle because of the way that you're holding the guitar you can angle i find angling the neck outwards like you guys might mm. not find this comfortable at all but I, because of the what the style i play i find angling the neck outwards more so as i'm stood up wherever the guitar is i'll often just angle the neck out like this or I've seen guys like Andy Wood, they will put one leg up and prop the guitar on the leg yeah. when they're stood up the like this. Thing. So you get more of the kind of angle that say someone like Joe, that kind of classical Joe Pass-esque kind of, where, where even, even the stretchiest of chords become kind of moderately okay to play. I can't think of one now, but maybe uh, something like. If I had to play that stood up with the guitar in the standard position, it's just impossible to actually, I've got it now because I've already gripped it, but you know, the guitar's not in the standard position anyway. But it's just a nightmare, whereas if you angle the guitar up, you know, that's a chordal thing, but from a technique perspective, you know, it all feels different when you stood up. You've got to practice that way. It's really, really important. Um, fusion chin strap or metal knee smasher. Dave Brown's, <laughs> you're a genius. Have you seen um, the, the Cotson interview? Fusion chin strap. <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's Rich Cox in an interview about um, it's like a it's like a gear one and he's talking about his guitar and then he sort of stands up and he's talking about like he says if he gets something really complicated he'll kind of go down on one knee and like you know he says if you see him do that you know some shit's about to go down mm. and then he sort of he goes on and says if if a guitar is, if a guy's got his guitar like this high I just can't take him seriously. But then he says, but down here doesn't work either. So he's kind of opted for. I don't know why you can't. Thing. Why can't you take someone seriously? If like, I mean, you can watch Alex Hutchins play. It's there, and man, you don't take that guy oh, seriously. Yeah. That's your well, issue. It's just Richard Cotton being Richard Cotton. Well, of course, you know the guy's as rock and roll as it gets, but you know. I think the um, higher the more serious it gets. Isn't it? It's yeah, like, quite. <laughs> I mean, it's quite like to, to end up like. If you see a guy coming into a game, yeah, like that. <laughs> Jesus Christ, this is going to be amazing. <laughs> I'm going to have my <laughs> harmony brain blown away. Um, so that's kind of interesting, but that that's a lot harder of a question to answer than mm. how do you get better and kind of not better. There's a lot of things you... involved. It's like technically there's some things involved, yeah. and then maybe psychologically there's probably even more involved. Than... Well, of course, because a lot of people do suffer from stage fright. I mean, we've talked about this before on the Guitar Hour, but Joe Satriani is renowned for having horrible nerves before gigs. Uh, but obviously, the deal with Joe Satriani is he can cope with those because A is experienced. And B he does it all the time. You know, it's like he has to be able to yeah. deal with that. So that level of he's probably done gigs that are much higher pressure than the gig you go and see him at. So he feels comfortable in that scenario. Certainly from my perspective, you know, we we've talked about this before as well. But you know, I play generally in front of, as I mentioned before, baying crowd and crowds or baying guitar players, rooms of guitar players. players. Yeah, exactly. And um, you know, once you've done that a few times, uh, you know, nothing else particularly seems that kind of. 
uh, nerve wracking. And that's a nice position to be in because you enjoy playing live at that point. You in, you enjoy the experience. You get excited for gigs as opposed to getting really nervous. But a really good thing I heard from John Gom, who you guys are all aware of, I'm sure, is that if you don't get something along these lines, I'm probably quoting him slightly wrong, but if you don't get nervous before a gig, there's something wrong, really. Or if you don't get nervous before an important part of your playing, there's something wrong because, you know, that's just part of the process. You know, it's like athletes. I used to do, this is just revealing a weird thing that I used to do. It's not weird, but you wouldn't expect Ooh. it. I used to, I used to be a, a sprinter. All right. You won't, you won't believe it from the physique now, after all the beer that I'm drinking. More uh, uh, Mercedes more sprinter. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks that's very a, much. That's a van joke. Thanks very much. Um, I'll remember that. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> I used to do sprinting and... I mean, I got so nervous before the gun went off at the beginning of every single race, I had to stop doing it. I couldn't do it anymore, it was just horrendous. Oh, I've got, I've got a good sports story. I, I did that. One, the only time I've ever, I'm not really the sporting type, but I. I really? Uh, you know, like Sports Day, you know, you have a sports day. So yeah, you, of you get sort of, you do one event for your. For the your sack school. race and the egg and spoon race. <laughs> I'm going to ignore sack race for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I was doing the. Doing the. Doing the uh, Dance hurdles. <laughs> And uh, in practice, been really good, you know, heard all fine, got really nervous, just sort of you set, decked off, it, set off a bit, a bit too vigorous, clipped the first hurdle and fell under the second one. That was it. Sports day over. Yeah, Levels well, that's, Im imagine that, but imagine you've done it at the Olympics. I mean, that happens. That's Well, you'd be famous. You know, right? Well, <laughs> very true, but for all the wrong reasons, you'd be viral, that's for sure. Um, you know, just... It's really difficult to answer in a kind of uh, succinct way, but you've got to do a lot of gigging, a lot of playing in front of people at any point you possibly can, and try as possible. And if it all goes horribly wrong, tell yourself it's not the end of the world because it isn't the end of the world. I'll just concentrate, even though it feels on like something it. else. Just concentrate on a different part of it. I mean, don't you know, worry about playing everything you know really well. It's, not, it's going to sound really, it's going to sound really odd, but maybe sort of worry about making it a good show and make it worry about looking good and sort of you know projecting a bit out to the audience and then the playing will sort of come a little bit easier I mean I when I first joined the band I was kind of obsessing about playing everything right and stuff like that and you know learning the tunes and all that kind of stuff and once I sort of loosened up and was like it doesn't matter I'm just gonna have a good time the playing's easy because you concentrate on something else do you know what I mean the playing's just there you can kind of you get yourself to you kind of the same the, the stage where the playing is just it sort of does it itself. I just there's a no, I don't know if you guys will get this, but uh, Richard Langard is put hi Richard by the way. Uh, well now Tom, the face you pulled when turning around and fighting Hadrian Faroud, the bass player, wanting a jam, that was one of pure nervousness. I, I, I played it. We we're playing at Music Mass. This happened to Martin as well, Martin Miller, and we both. It was at different years, and I think one of, I don't know if they were both at Music Mess or one was at NAM, mine was at Music Mess. You got Hadrian Faroud sat there on the stage, and he's like this, and you're going, what the hell? It was one of the most nervous moments of my entire life. It doesn't just help horrendous. that he's like proper, like. It doesn't help that he's a it's just freak like, show. Uh, you know. That's, that's, again, like, it's very difficult to get yourself in this kind of scenario if you are not going, you know, you're not, you're not in. How do I say it? So you're not you walking down those alleys at midnight. <laughs> well, no, but like you're not in scenarios where you're going to be able to play with guys like that. But you know, if you can play with <laughs> XX, the fancy guy XX, thank you for following the stream. Thank you so much. Um, if you can get yourself in scenarios where you're playing with guys who are, you know, people you kind of hero worship, it's very difficult. Again, very very difficult. But if you can do that, that's always a good way of going as well because those guys terrify you. So. You know, again, anything else that you do feels slightly less terrifying. Um, I don't know. You know, it's, it's difficult. The thing is, coming, doing it and then coming out the other side and it went going really well, you get like a really positive rush of, I guess it's adrenaline, but the, the sense of achievement afterwards where, oh, it didn't go that bad. Yeah, it's I mean, don't, massive. You know. try, try not to be one of those guys that um, if you say, say you go to, a, say your hero is Steve Vai. And you go, you know, that's fairly plausible because the man's a genius. You go to one of his, what does he call them? I can't remember the, the clinics he does, the master classes. Five. Something experience or something, I don't know what he calls them. Um, so you go to one of those and there's an opportunity to play with the guy. You should be the guy with your hand thrust right up in the air you wanting to play with the guy. Because you'll be hideously nervous, you'll be in front of a load of guitar players. Once you've done it, 
you know, provided it doesn't go hideously badly, provided it goes okay, which it probably will, because yeah. uh, Steve, say for instance in that scenario, Steve's going to be really encouraging, he's going to be really nice. Steve Vi praises you, you've played with Steve Vi on stage, everything else seems a little bit less nervous after that, a little bit less kind of difficult. Um, I realise that's not a scenario you can do every day, but if an yep. opportunity like that comes around, be the guy that says yes and grasps it with both hands. I've regretted sort of backing out of those kind of things. I mean, I've been to master classes with you and Rick eight like a few years ago, and it's like, does anyone want to go up? And I've just been like, you know, and there's, there's actually and a again, time in, uh, easier said in, than uh, done. In Texas, where there was a band playing, and uh, I wanted to get up and just sort of try and jam lap steel with them. And uh, they were playing like tunes that are well kind of jammable, but I just I didn't. And then they just kept playing tunes that I knew, and I was like, oh, well, I wish I'd got up, and I just didn't. And I probably really regret uh, that now. And once, once how, you, how am I ever going to come across that situation again? Well, the other thing is that once you put yourself in that scenario and you do say no, it's ten times harder to say yes the next time. Or if you if someone invites you to, to play on a jam session and you say no for the first few tunes, it's then you've put yourself in a scenario where it's much harder to say yes for the next few tunes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just, Or they are, won't ask you again, they're just like, yeah. oh, really, just not there, for it. There are points where it's a wiser decision to say yes and then deal with the, now this is not always the case, obviously, but it's, it's wiser to say yes and then deal with the consequences immediately afterwards than it is just to not do the thing that you, sh you, you know, you're, for want of a better term, chickening out of, essentially. Um, so it's always a good idea to kind of be the guy that goes, yeah, me, 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 you know, um, just because it's going to make you much better at dealing with pressurised situations. Um, oh, Richard Langard, be quiet. Don't be daft. Um, yeah, there we go. Tony's jam with Vi was fab. Uh, Dave Bronze jamming on Steve Vi on my bucket list. It doesn't matter who it is. You know, whoever you get the chance to jam with, it's really important that you, you go for that. Um, how are we doing for time? One hour and ten minutes. My word, we'll probably have to draw this to a close at some point very soon, which means that we probably won't be able to get onto our main topic again. This which is, is just kind follow of follow up, isn't it? Yep, yeah, essentially. Uh, we've, we're just going to end up listing loads and loads and loads of topics. Um, mm. <clears throat> so, I guess what we should do is just a few kind of housekeeping things um, and also introduce this new section that we're going to be doing. And I'll probably, uh, yeah, I am actually going to recommend something to you guys as well. So, first of all, let's introduce this new section, which is entitled, because Dan came up with it, I'll let Dan tell you what it's called. Uh, we've gone with, if you like, if you like that, you might like this kind of thing. Genius. And this is, this is kind of stemmed from seeing um, uh, Tom's earlier post. I mean, we, we haven't really got time to go into it. We haven't, unfortunately. We'll be um, here for two hours. Essentially, it was about... If I'm going to what it was about, you can't write it. Would you want me to say what it was about, and then you can do... You can do well, your... essentially, it was people... Assuming certain players have come in and they've just do that certain one style and there's nothing that's sort of gone before it, yeah. quite sort of. Um, they 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 are the be all and end all of guitar and nothing else came before, nothing else comes afterwards. That's that's it basically. And everybody must be influenced by those people by that yeah. person. That everybody must listen to that person surely, you know, so on and so forth. So it's kind of like a fairly blinkered viewpoint of guitar playing. Yeah. So we, we thought it was kind of important to kind of maybe, for guys who aren't so familiar with some of the older stuff, or not older stuff, but just kind of classic records or classic guitar it's players. It's just where, where these guys that are seemingly, uh, I don't want to say flawless, but these guys that seemingly have it all stylistically and, uh, and that kind of thing, where they may have got some of these things from, or if you like certain aspects of their playing. For instance, uh, just an example, off the top of my head is, that kind of country thing that Guthrie does there's probably guys that think well that's country I don't need to go anywhere else I'll just get it off him um, whereas he's probably got that from a few other guys you know Lee Brett Mason Danny Gatton you know numerous others um, and then there's the other you know other parts of the plane where you can go right well where did that come from kind of like uh, <laughs> I don't know if to, whether to say this now because it's not really annoying but you know like the, the, the picking thing that Martin's really good at you know, yes. the fresh ducks thing that it's kind of like the Steve Morse thing, right? Yeah. Which I think he said is a Steve Morse thing, so I'm mm -hmm. not gonna I'm not saying, Oh, you so much Steve Morse. Um <laughs> but you can you can sort of go, Oh well, well that's cool and rather than just going to that one guy and saying, Right, that he must he must have invented that you know, you can sort of go about well if you like that, go back and see this guy, check this record out, check this out, you know. Kind of uh 
Well, that's so the idea, isn't rather it? Rather than assuming that person invented it, use it as a springboard to go back and discover cool music. And yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, and it's because there's so much stuff out there, <clears throat> it's quite hard to know where to go. Do you know what I mean? I, mean, I remember going to my guitar teacher uh, ages ago and like hearing uh, like a little riff or a little like a bend thing or something, and it's like, oh, you're doing that thing. And then it's, check this guy, this guy, this guy out. And then it's like, oh, right, great. And then you, you, you're going with it, you're going to some music with a, mm. a bit of a focus then. It's like, all right, I'm going to go and steal that, that that guy does, you know, um, who probably didn't invent that either. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I, I've got, basically, um, let me find a couple of things for you to uh, listen to if you're not familiar with them. Now, one, one of the things I was going to say was, um, yeah, there we go. So, when I first heard... Uh, Guthrie, we're going to use the example of Guthrie because he's the guy that was cited in my post earlier on. One of the first things I ever heard him play was a transcription in Guitar Techniques magazine of some Pat Metheny licks. Right. And obviously Pat Metheny is a massive kind of influence on me. A lot of people talk about Pat Metheny, but I'm not sure if they've listened to many of his records. So I'm going to recommend three for you. This is good because I've not... Guilt... Guilt... Guiltily. I've not actually done much time on uh, Pat Metheny. I've got, you don't, I've got you don't have to. We're not saying you guys should. Uh, it's just I've not quite. You've got to be sort of ready for some stuff, and I wasn't quite ready, so I thought I'll just leave that for a little bit. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna um, pick three albums that the transcriptions came from because what's really interesting about this is, or for me anyway, is that this must have been about 1996 before I was into jazz at all. I would have been much more interested in what Guthrie was doing back then than what Pat Metheny was doing but these licks really stuck with me um, and they were absolutely you know mind-blowing at the time I've never heard anything like it um, so the first album I'm going to recommend is one that most a lot of people are familiar with which is Bright Size Life okay so obviously this if you don't write these don't worry about writing these down or anything guys this stream's going to go on YouTube so if you want to check these out you can do that's a Pat Metheny record that's a Pat Metheny uh, record where uh, Pat has done all the compositions or the majority of them I believe it was it's got Jacko on bass um, Jacob Pastorius. Uh, so, Bright Side Life, that's the first one. Really, really, really amazing record. Um, the next one I'm going to recommend to you is Still Life Talking. The reason I'm going to recommend that one to you is there's a track called Third Wind, which you just have to hear the solo from. The solo break, basically, that happens in Third Wind, is one that Guthrie transcribed in Guitar Techniques magazine. And he said himself it was one of the most mind blowing things he'd ever heard. Check that out, that's unbelievable. And then the next one I'm going to recommend is a, that's a Pat Metheny group album, by the way. So that's, uh, there's Lyle Mays has, has written a few tracks on there as well. And then I'm going to recommend Beyond the Missouri Sky, I think it's called. I've got brain failure. Is that right? Beyond the Missouri Sky. Uh, which is a duo album with a bass player called Charlie Hayden. Charlie Hayden unfortunately died um, last year or the year before, I forget. Incredible um, upright bass player. Jack Black's stepdad. Is that right? What? Oh, Jack Black's. What? Oh, I don't know. Really? I think... Jack Black, this might be wrong, is married to his daughter. We're going to have to check that out. Um, so Beyond the Missouri Sky, I'm Still Life Talking out. and Bright Size Life, those three albums. And they basically will give you a very wide view of Pat Metheny's playing. Um, because one is very early, the next one is kind of a middle stage, and then the, the, the one after that is, it's still a, you know, a relatively, it's not a new album by any stretch, but it's certainly a more modern sounding album. Um, it's, it's just gorgeous. Compositions. The majority of it, 95, no, not that much. Uh, Beyond the Missouri Sky has got some arrangements of some Ennio Morricone tunes, stuff from right. Cinema Paradiso, uh, various other tunes, uh, or various other films on there. So it's absolutely gorgeous, but it will give you a really good overview of how lyrical his playing is, how technical his playing is, and how compositionally astounding the man is it's unbelievable and again if you want to listen to those albums and follow through the scores you can get the Pat Metheny real book at all good vendors whatever vendor you want to get it from I don't know Amazon or whatever um, Amazon now owe me some money uh, you can get the Pat Metheny real book and read through the charts as the score is going is as there, the score is going as the CD is going or as the mp3 whatever you're listening to is can, going is there an album you can recommend for uh like standards and stuff just yeah if you want to go for it down that route as well question and answer yeah is that what you're going to say question and answer, yeah. question and answer. maybe the trio type b the later ones yeah some, um the 2000 is it no, no 2000 it is absolutely standards on that as well but he's definitely you know a composer yeah, like yeah, a, yeah, yeah. as a like i mean he obviously plays standards 
better than I ever, ever will. Or most <laughs> people ever will, but he, he definitely his compositions are just... Well, you may amazing. remember a while ago on the guitar where I did this lick, which I'm going to screw up now because I haven't played it for ages, but... Let me do that again. Which is a Pat Metheny lick that Guthrie, this is really weird the way this comes around, a Pat Metheny lick that Guthrie Govan transcribed back in 1996 on the album Question and Answer from the tune Old Folks, the standard Old Folks. And if you listen to that solo, you'll find that in there. And it's just an outrageously good solo, outrageously good playing in general. So, unless you guys have got anything particularly you want to recommend, we might have to leave it there, I think. No. I'll wrap it up there. All right. All right, guys. So, as usual, thank you so much for watching. We will be back maybe in Budapest next maybe week. Maybe after that. It's probably going to be... Maybe the week after. Maybe, yeah. We'll see. We'll see yeah. what happens. But um, Dave Bronze will be joining us again. Uh, we'll have you on the show many more times, I'm sure. But yeah, Dave Bronze will be joining us if he's available, uh, which I think he is. If he's not uh, off being a good dad. Yeah, exactly. He's Stop doing... being such a good dad, Dave. It's <laughs> unbelievable. You're making us feel bad. Um, all right, guys. So, oh, somebody's written all those tunes in the chat. Tom Gladhill, thank you so much. He's written the tunes and the, the albums in the chat. All right, guys. So we will see you next time. Thank you so much for watching us. Thanks to our new followers. Oh, a quick couple of things. Um, Dave Bronze pointed this out to me. Uh, if you have signed up with Twitch so that you can get notifications for when we go live, make sure you've verified your email address with them or else you won't get those notifications. I think Dave found the notification in his spam folder, so just check that, especially if you use Gmail. That's the first thing. The second thing, um, don't forget, if you do like the Guitar Hour and you watch it regularly and you think it's a good thing, you can if you want, you don't have to at all. Um, we've had some very generous donations over the past um, sort of couple of weeks or so or whatever there's underneath the stream there's a donation button if you want to donate anything all the funds that we get will be put straight back into the stream for either making the stream more sophisticated or getting guests in um doing interviews so on and so forth so if you guys want to see more names uh, bigger names not bigger big names they don't get much bigger than us three but uh, bigger names on the guitar hour then we'll try and do that for you as well so that's the donation button underneath and then finally keep interacting us with with us on facebook we like the questions we like the interaction um, and then we'll use your topics in the guitar hour so long as as i mentioned last time it's not how do i play jazz you know something that's just this massively broad open-ended unbelievably complex subject we will do our best to answer your questions the stuff that you might get in any kind of guitar forum or yeah exactly you know what i mean that kind of thing exactly all right guys thank you so much for watching we will see you